Thank you so much, Paulina, for this invitation. And thank you, everyone, for coming in today to speak about this very important topic and a very important sector for investors as well. Um, before I answer the question, I just wanted to um, just say that, yeah, I just want to go first, um, why why responsible labor practice matter to investors? And I think this is, um, I mean, it does go to your question. Um, and it also explained, um, because of, I, I mean, I'm just remembering one comment from the, the, the little bit that I could hear from the previous panel that one of the um, speakers was uh, suggesting or saying that, that her um, recommendation would be not to put um, shareholders' um, returns um, above um, human rights and, and labor practices. And I think that's, that's, that's very correct. And actually, I would even go as far as say that shareholder returns in the longer term do depend on, on better labor practices and sustainable and responsible labor practices. So, I mean, they matter to investors principally because uh, um, the, the idea is for, for companies to understand the impact that they have on people and how the activities impact people. Um, we in the PRI we use as the main framework where frame, our main framework for looking at social issues is the UN guiding principles, and in them um, it is very well defined the responsibility of investors as private actors to respect human rights. And I would say that this is independent from the duty of the states to protect human rights. So even though we do need public policy and a level playing field, this should not stop investors and companies from um, taking responsibility to respect human rights. Um, and they therefore need to understand the root causes of systemic issues in the apparel industry and how they affect people and how they um, and how these then in turn influence investments and financial returns. So I think this distinction is very important in the sense that yeah, the UN guided principles also um, outline that you should think about risk of people and before you think about risk of business. Um, the, the issue with uh, the garment sector um, in general, at least for labor practices, is, is um, the multi-tier relationships in supply chains. And this is because of the lack of traceability and therefore the lack of visibility or where the risk can materialize. And therefore the scope for this risk and negative human rights impacts remains um, very large till this day. So some of the risks that companies and, and therefore investors um, could have by not addressing these issues well, first, first of all, is a reputational risk. So potential brand damage and consumer backlash when they are um, involved in issues of forced labor or in issues um, uh, related to supply chains. Then there are issues that are or risks that are operational. So potential cost savings from cheaper labor can have an impact on lead time um, as well as productivity and, and product quality. So this could cause disruption in supply chains, causing stockouts, loss of sales, reduced market share, and lack of trust, um, which in turn will have uh, financial impacts as well. And then lastly, there are legal and regulatory risks. So we see that there is a global regulatory pressure increasing. We don't see legislations becoming less. If anything, we see them popping up more and more. So we see we have uh, examples of this is the Modern Slavery Act in the UK, and more recently now an act in Australia, the duty of care of parent companies and ordering companies in, in France, the Dutch child labor um, due diligence law, the Trade and Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act in the US, which bans the import of goods produced by forced labor, for example. So there is a lot of um, legislation that is coming up that is gonna force companies to have to look into these issues in their supply chains, whether they consider them important or not. Um, at the same time, there is a lot of opportunities in addressing these issues, and it's basically the flip side of the risk. So when you have motivated employees and employees that feel protected and are paid correctly, um, this increases productivity and improves quality. And we do know that factories with improved labor practices reduce their product rejection rates by 44%. And also, it will, it, it, by having long-term relationships with suppliers, uh, companies have better access to supply chain innovations as well as better supply um, security. So why is this sector specifically important for investors? Well, I mean, the garment sector is, is, is valued at $3 trillion and it accounts for 2% of the GDP. Therefore, um, it is safe to say that uh, all investors around the world do have the garment sector um, in their portfolios in some shape or other. Um, historically, it is a sector that has increased the number of um, workers employed and it provides employment opportunities for women because we know that three quarters of garment workers uh, worldwide are female, youth and low skilled workers as well. 
um, and it enables developing markets to pursue um, export-oriented industrialization. However, um, it must be said that the industry does carry a number of significant risks to workers. And if we look at the most recent Know the Change benchmark with um, uh, benchmarks 37 of the biggest um, brands in the apparel and footwear sector, um, the results are very uh, are not very encouraging. So they, uh, this uh, benchmark was um, recently published in, in this year, in 2021, and it says that 54% of companies had forced labor supply chain allegations. Only 11% of the companies evaluated disclosed multiple remedy outcomes for workers, and 49%, so almost half of the companies, have scored zero on the most worker-centric um, indicators. And luxury brands, on average, score very poorly. Um, so this this is this is quite a, a, a really bad picture when it comes to labor practices in supply chains, and when it comes to labor practices in general in the garment sector. And this, I mean, we know that the workers in the apparel supply chains are amongst the hardest hit um, by the COVID nineteen pandemic, and even before the pandemic, the conditions were in great. And in the first um, three months alone of the pandemic, workers lost at least US three billion dollars um, um, in income. So obviously, this is this. I mean, the the impacts are, have you uh, have been highlighted by the pandemic, and if anything, has increased the urgency of action in these issues in supply chains. So um, just to finish my my comments, so what investors look um, look for in companies when assessing responsible labor practices? Um, I mean, they, the short answer to that question is the implementation of the UN guiding principles. And then how does that look like in practice? Is if we think about governance of human rights, is um, understanding whether companies have a human right policy in place, which reflects senior management by in an oversight, but also how these policies embedded in the organization. So who has ultimate responsibility for labor and human rights within the company and the supply chains? clear links between um, ethical sourcing and buying teams. This is hugely important because the alignment of incentives, incentives reduce the risk of negative human rights outcomes in supply chains. Um, sometimes, yeah, um, cost incentives in buy, buying teams can, can actually um, increase the risk of um, forced labor or child labor or short lead times and, and other issues in supply chains that obviously uh, do worse by, by, by workers. And recruitment practices as well. So especially when it comes to migrant workers, um, migrants and refugees mm -hmm. are an increased um, risk of exploitation as they tend to lack access to legal employment contracts and social security. Um, and this is including recruitment fees, which ends up in being um, an issue of bonded labor for many migrant workers around the world. Um, a second aspect is the company management of potential and actual human rights. So um, this comes, and this has been mentioned over and over by other panelists as well, which is supply chain mapping. Visibility beyond the first year is key. Um, companies need to better map their supply chains, and they need to share this information publicly or at least with investors to understand where risk could materialize and where action is needed. Relationship with suppliers. So, I mean, investors who try to encourage long-term relationships um, uh, between suppliers and companies to avoid last-minute changes in orders um, and contracts and increasingly shorter lead times as well, which are clearly known to, to be factors that increase significantly the risk of forced labor and child labor, as well as increase the overtime um, and, and long working hours. Um, so, so as well, they would encourage consolidated supply chains that can help with the visibility issue and to reduce exposure to labor issues. Um, better understanding um, of disclosure of labor practices in supply chain and better approach to auditing as well. I mean, companies tend to do auditing as a tick box exercise and rely too much on the results of these exercises as a way of um, considering that there are no issues in supply chains. But companies that show serious commitment and greater maturity to tackling human rights risk are increasingly moving away from auditing and establishing a local presence that can work with and monitor progress with worker-led initiatives, local stakeholders, such as trade unions, NGOs, and civil society organizations. And lastly, which is connected to my last point, is better the engagement with NGOs, and worker unions, and community organizations. So lack of worker voice across the supply chain is a key industry risk. Freedom of association and collective bargaining, bargaining can enable workers to better negotiate um, working conditions as well as wages, 
and with community organizations and NGOs, unions can provide information from, from the ground to allow invest, investors to corroborate um, so the information that suppliers and companies report back. And the last action will be about monitoring and corrective action. This is increasingly important um, and is probably the one aspect of the UN guiding principles that is most overlooked, which is about grievances mechanisms and access to remedy. So according to the UN guiding principles, businesses not only have the responsibility to avoid infringing on the human rights of others, but should also remediate any adverse human rights impacts they have caused or might contribute to. So companies should be more transparent about the effectiveness of the grievance mechanisms and the remediation actions and ensure that workers in supply chains know of those mechanisms and how to make use of them. This is crucially important and because this is the way that investors and companies will have better visibility of labor issues. So in general, like these are these is, are the reasons why labor practices are so important for investors and for and in terms of a company. And we truly believe that financial returns will be hindered if these issues are not properly addressed, uh, besides all the environmental impacts that obviously the garment sector and supply chains have, um, uh, are related to as well. So I'll stop there. And yeah, I am happy to answer any questions later on.